Amazing. Okay. Well, welcome to the Women's March Canada podcast, making the equality of women in Canada the new norm. This is episode 36, titled The Bottler at Your Service. My name is Melissa Durrell. I'm your host. Uh, Women's March Canada inspires, unites, and leads the charge of advancement of women across Canada. Please welcome this week's guest. I'm super excited, Ritika Dutt. Uh-huh. Now, a little bit of intro here on you, Ritika. Is she's the co-founder of Bottler AI. It's an artificial intelligence program, software program, that makes legal services accessible to the average person and aims to provide sexual assault victims with a more positive reporting experience. That's incredible. I can't wait to hear more about your story. So prior to her working at Bot, um, Butler AI, I want to make sure I say that right. Butler. It's like robot butler. Butler. Oh, I love it. Uh, Ratika worked as the campus coordinator for the Mason Notman House and as a marketing manager for Ooh La La Mobile Inc. So you've got a ton of experience. So Ratika, tell me, why did you start this? Um. Oh, specifically the harassment your company. Yeah, your company. Yeah, your company. How did you get involved? Well, um, so how Butler started was really the experiences of my co-founder. And um, I'm sure you're aware that we started off in immigration. Mm-hmm. So what we did is apply uh, artificial intelligence in the scope of Canadian immigration to help make the process as smooth and seem- as seamless as possible. And... Um, so back um, about a year and a bit, a year and a half ago, I had my own experience with a, a stalker. So there was this guy that was literally every day following me, showed up at my workplace, and he was always there watching from the corner and just would just stare at me for hours on end. And um, I had a job where I was very, very exposed to the public and I was always at events and there was always people around me. But in the scope of that job, I had to work really late often. Mm -hmm. And so I was often the last one out. I lived very close to my workplace and he was always there. He was watching me when I went out Mm, and it was just a a horrible feeling. And the reason it it troubled me so much is because of, of quite a few people I I knew very personally and very close, had very bad experiences with stalkers, right. which uh, in some cases ended very tragically. And I just saw so many patterns of how it was going with my case and what had happened to them. And it terrified me. But at the same time, the problem was I didn't know my rights. I didn't know that this was actually a crime. I think. And uh, this is police or you just no, not at all. On One of the things is I feel that women really we try to look, see the best in everybody. We say, no, no, no. Okay. It's not as bad as as I think it is. And I I really told myself, no, it's in your head, Ritika. You're, you know, it's not that bad or it's okay. You will, it'll like go away soon. And it was, was it just personal, like on the street or was it online as well? Um, he, it was a mixture of everything. So he was texting me, he was Facebook, like poking me, which I didn't know even existed anymore. (laughs) And then uh, he saw my, uh, my behavior online and he saw that I said I was attending a conference and then he starts messaging me, hey, I'm uh, not a conference, sorry, a concert. Yeah. So he starts messaging me at night, hey, I'm here right now. And I got terrified. So I didn't go to this concert that I was really looking forward to. No and my friend said that he was there the whole night. He was sitting by the bar. He started leaving me voicemails where he didn't say anything. And it was just the background music. And honestly, it terrified me. So long story short, I was very fortunate. Nothing bad came out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't seen the the person in question since. I'm very fortunate. But um, when I was far removed from the situation, that was really the first time that I realized, okay, you know, now that I can think clearly, I don't have like the tension and the pressure and the stress on me. Um, Like this is not okay. And I started doing more research into it. And this also coincided with the same time that the Me Too movement started. I just remember every day reading more and more accounts of people saying, okay, you know, this every happened. Every woman we know, right? Exactly. And on, it's really sad, but I can't yeah. think of even one woman I know that hasn't had to deal with something bad in some way, shape or form. So at that point, I started to do more research saying, okay, we're all going through this. Why is no one coming out? Like, why is no one really understanding when it's happening? Right. And what the research showed was that, honestly, people don't even know what constitutes harassment, Hmm. which was the same thing in my situation. I knew that, okay, this is something bad that's happening. I'm very uncomfortable, but I didn't know that I had any rights. I didn't know it was a federal criminal offense, uh, which is known as criminal harassment here in Canada, stalking. I really, I just didn't know my rights. And at the same time, 
we had this technology, this artificial uh, tech uh, intelligence technology. And I thought, okay, so what can we do that we can apply this technology that we have to kind of have some sort of resource for everyone else that's out there because there seems to be a lot of us that are going through the situation to give them some sort of first layer of help or education cool. to say, okay, let's go and, you know, discuss our situation somewhere completely anonymously with no judgment, no personal details, no defining personal factors and get just like that first layer of information, yeah. which is often the hardest step. The, the step where you're so confused, you're so drawn into yourself, you really don't know, should I talk about it? Should I not? Are people going to judge me? Right. Am I going to face retaliation? Um, am I going to be ostracized? Like, is this going to have an impact on my career? Right. So at that stage, I wanted to just have this first layer of help where people could come and discuss their situation, get a first layer of just education. And then at, with that, hopefully say, okay, you know what? based on this, I think I want to pursue this or, okay, you know, I'm uncomfortable and, um, you know, maybe I should just go and tell the person that I don't feel comfortable, please like just stop yes. your behavior. Cause it doesn't necessarily have to be escalated. Okay. Right. And that's exactly what we did. Incredible. So, uh, the, how long ago was that where you, I mean, uh, what's your timeline here? Where did you go from sort of being the, the harassment time to figuring out that this was actually not just your problem, but a national global problem to creating how this now works? How long did that take? Um, so this started actually maybe in 2007 with someone that was very, very close to me that had a horrific experience with a stalker. I won't go into too many details, but that was really my first experience yeah. with this and then nothing else happened and then my stalker started um at the very end of 2016 it went on for about five or six months and then um i was removed from the situation i didn't have anything else to do with him and then i believe it was maybe last november that i started to do more research into the situation and just corroborate all the stories that i was reading coming out of the me too movement with my own experiences and the research um, and it's then that we decided, um, okay, let's take the technology that we have, apply it to the criminal code uh, uh, regarding sexual misconduct, and let's build this tool. And we launched it the first week of December. So I believe it's been about six, seven months now. And talk to me, how many people are using it? Like, what are some of the, I mean, I'm at, you're helping a lot of people. Um, so I'm curious uh, what that looks like from a business perspective. Um, so first off, the, the tool is completely free. This is something that really it's not, we're not looking to make a profit or anything. It's just having been in that situation, it's just a free resource for other people to come and use as a starting point, yeah. get some information and then be more empowered or feel more comfortable to make a decision yeah. on what they want to do. And, um, since we launched, we had about just under 35,000 users so far uh, which is amazing because one of the things that we really feared at first is, are people going to trust a robot? They, right. Yeah. They, you know, it's not a person and this is something so personal. Are they going to feel comfortable discussing something that's so raw and so emotional and so, so tense often with somebody that's really not a person? It's, it's very obviously a, a software. Yeah. Um, and actually, that was what we anticipated at the beginning would be our biggest challenge with the tool. And it's turned out to be one of our greatest strengths. Um, our tool is completely anonymous, but users often use the tool and then reach out to me afterwards and say, you know, I felt so much better. One of the best things is that there's no pressure. You're not seeing someone face to face. You can't read their emotions. It's just like the face of a little robot staring at you and you feel, okay, you know, he's not going to judge me. There's right. nothing else going on there. Like... I feel like it's, there's a face there. So it feels like I'm, you know, dealing with somebody and there's like a personality there, but there's none of the other stuff that comes with the stress of having to deal with somebody face to face. So how does it work? If I was in a, I was going to log in, mm -hmm. uh, what, so what are the, what's the, what are the steps? So at first you go to our website, you have to sign up with your email, validate it. And then what we do is we ask you a series of questions. So right now it's available just based on the criminal codes of the U S and Canada. Um, but if you're from a different country and we have a lot of people that are that try to reach, uh, reach us through the tool, yeah, you can say I'm involved because you said Canada was out. Did you launch with Canada and the U.S. or just Canada? Canada and the U.S. You did. Okay. That's amazing. So, and, and then of course there's the rest of the world. So are you going to be yeah. adding them on as well? 
Yes, we would love to expand to have it available in as many countries as possible. Okay. So right now what happens is, sorry. Sorry, so back to you. So you log yeah. in. And so you log in and what you do is Canada. we'll first ask you where are you based? So okay. if you're based in Canada and the US, uh, like we'll be able to provide you with uh, the service and if not, we'll say, where are you? Tell us where you are, what language you'd like the tool in, and is there anything else that you'd like help How many with languages that? do you have? Uh, well, right now it's just in English, but we'd like to add it at least in French to begin with and then yeah. expand. That's right, because you're Montreal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, after that, it's pretty simple what we did and very consciously as well based on our experiences just with building the tool and our immigration tool is we started off by asking a series of yes or no questions just to make it as easy as possible to answer as yeah. the user because often like they really are tough questions and they are emotional questions we don't want them to think and say okay let me write out response so what happens is we start off with a series of yes or no questions and depending on your answers um butler will say okay this is a follow-on question or based on this answer i think this is the next question so you'll be asked a series of questions and at the end you have the option to say okay i want to also describe my situation to you in my own words uh and we can take that and analyze the responses as well and say okay based on all the information that we gathered from this conversation we believe that there is a very high possibility. And of course, this, there's nothing that we can say with certainty. This is all a process, like it's a statistical process. Right, but um, it's validation, so, right? For people, it's exactly. that's really it. Like, just like you said yourself, you knew you were going through it, but you didn't, you needed that validation. You need some sort of support, right? To say, okay, I'm not crazy. Like I have a yeah. right to be upset in this situation. Yeah. So, and I'll tell you two actually interesting stories about users right after this. Yeah, please. So, <laughs> it's, it's fun to talk about. So, yeah. um, afterwards, we take all the, Botler rather, takes all the information, analyzes it, and then sends you an email saying, okay, based on your information, and depending on which country you're based in, either the US or Canada, um, these are the laws that we believe might have been violated in your situation, or perhaps we didn't come across any potential violations. And in that case, it doesn't necessarily mean nothing happened. It just... Maybe the bot wasn't able to pick it up, or maybe it's not a criminal violation, but there's something that you should still look into, which may be a civil issue. Yeah. Um, and so the user gets this package, and if they choose to describe the situation in their own words, we'll also take all the information and compile it in a report for them so that they have some sort of copy uh, saved just to have as a reference in the future. If something happens, saying, okay, well, I have documentation that this happened. Now I'm going to add this now and move on. Can you take that then to the police? Is that something that people have done? They've um, once they've used your your Butler 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 yeah. yeah. Do do they print and then take to the police and say these are? I mean, to me, that would be the one of the most useful things. Uh, the way we built it was really just to have this sort of documentation of you have everything organized and you're asked questions so that you know you're not really feeling that scatterbrained. You can think, okay. These were the things I have to write down. These are the important facts. Yeah. Uh, and you, we really had in mind that you can have this document that you could take to the police or you could take to maybe your HR department, maybe your school or college. Um, and I know people have printed it out and saved it. I don't know if anyone's taken it to the police, but actually, um, and this is such a crazy story. So we had not one, but two different uh, police officers from South Korea, completely different cities. They had no knowledge of each other whatsoever. Um, they emailed me within maybe like a week and a half of each other saying, hi, I'm a police officer from South Korea. I read about you in the news and uh, I really need you to translate this tool right now into Korean so that we can use it as part of our investigations. And I said, wow, that's amazing. Like I have no idea yeah. like how you came across this, but that's, that's a very great validation for us that you think it's a very useful tool. So I, I guess there may be a use for that. That's very cool. And yeah, I mean, isn't it whenever you start a company, it's that the customer validation and you're getting it from everywhere. Um, yeah. Talk to me about, have you had anyone say anything like that, that this has allowed them to either um, uh, pursue charges or like what's some of the feedback that you're getting from the people? I'm sure. assuming mostly female, would you say? Um, actually, that's what we had assumed going in and we thought it would just be people who are survivors of situations yeah. that would be using the tool that was completely surprisingly, of course, to us, but, which is, I think, amazing. We had a very good mix of men and women, yeah. um, people who were the survivors of a situation and also people who um, were 
like in a way against the perpetrators, but they didn't realize that they'd done something wrong. So they wanted to come and use the tool to check, okay, was my behavior a violation? Because I just don't know if what is okay and what's not okay. And that I think is very amazing. It's not something at all that occurred to me at the beginning that people might come and use this to check, is my behavior okay? But I think it's it's a very good sign that if people are using it, like there's like all hope is not lost. People want to know, okay, is my behavior okay or not? But maybe they're not that comfortable going and asking someone face to face, but this gives them a resource to say, okay, this behavior, no, 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 we can't do this. But yeah. okay, I see that my intentions may have been good in this situation, but it didn't come across this way. I so, love that. I had, I remember when the Me Too movement was really starting to peak and I had a lot of male CEOs saying, like, you know, and, and they're, they're very intelligent people and, yeah. and they were really struggling with, you know, how do I act around women? And I, I, you know, I really blanket statemented saying like treat male and female business the same, the same way. Yeah. But that said, um, you know, but their actions have happened in the past. And I think that that your tool is actually really interesting because there's the anonymity behind it. So you can ask those questions like, is it appropriate for me to have done this? And, you know. What do I, or, you know, I think that's just really interesting. You could go really deep on that, I think. What about yeah. security? Like, are you, I mean, that, that would be a big concern for me is that somehow, you know, my information gets out. What kind of things have you done to ensure that people really have that security? I mean, absolutely. Of course, like you're talking about something so personal. Security is your number one concern. Um, and I think that we're, we're doing a good job of it, if I may say so. So yes. we I use... Can. <laughs> well we use bank level encryption so everything is encrypted but we don't store any of the data because it's it's so personal it's not something that we need to have access to um so once you use the tool you get your output by email and then uh we get rid of the data it's all deleted we don't save anything we ask you specifically when you use the tool please don't give us your name your address your phone number like any defining characteristics gender nationality, race, just don't give us anything that could be related back to you, make it as neutral as possible and keep it as anonymous as possible. So mm -hmm. there, there's very little chance of anything ever being linked to a certain person. So what's interesting to me is that this, is, this could be, there's so many, there, there's so much growth potential in it, but you're not making any money off of it. So, um, you know, and, and that's, that's a hard, uh, like I, I'm thankful that you've done this, but, um, like, how, how do you grow it from here? Because if you do want to translate and, and offer it to different countries, um, from Korean to Arabic to all of these different languages, that must cost money. So how are you keeping this afloat? So, um, like I said, we started off in immigration, and that's where our main business is, where we're generating cash flows. But this, is, this tool is something that's very personal to myself and a lot of uh, people. So it's not something that we're looking to monetize. It's really just something... It's like a passion project that we want to keep going. We want to use profits and funding from our other operations to help fund and finance and keep afloat. So there's, we're never going to ha be in a situation where we'll need to actually have people pay for the right to learn their basic rights. Yeah, you say that, but wow, that's incredible. Um, so I, this, I mean, you've become a bit of a, an activist, I guess, in your own right for, for women's <laughs> rights. Have you always been a feminist? I mean, I, I find this question so weird when people say, are you a feminist? Are you not a feminist? I feel like if you're born, like you want equality for women, like you want, it, it shouldn't be a question in my opinion, if that makes sense. I think it yeah. shouldn't be an issue. Like men and women should be the same. I mean, you shouldn't have to think about like, okay, I'm going to fight for women's rights because it should be like a given, right? right. It should so, be. I, I guess yes. If that like if that's what you want to define as a feminist, then of course. But I really think in this day and age, it shouldn't even be a question. It should be we all have the same rights. Like it shouldn't be a discussion. It should just be a given. A hundred percent agree. But I mean, I, I like to talk to this, especially with women in tech, because you're often uh, very outnumbered. So, yeah. what, like, uh, did you grow up in Montreal then? No, not at all. I'm actually, so I'm Indian, but I've never lived there. I grew up in Hong Kong and then in Singapore. And when it came time to apply to colleges, I applied to McGill in Montreal and I got accepted, of course. So I came and I studied here and I just love Canada so much. 
And I, I really loved Montreal as well. So I decided, okay, you know, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to get involved and get to see the city more outside of like the library and the McGill campus. And that's how I ended up here. What do you love about Canada? I love how open and friendly and nice everyone is. And you, you <laughs> Those know are all the stereotypes, aren't they? We're so nice. <laughs> I think everyone makes fun of this, oh my God, Canada, let's say sorry, but yeah. it's really refreshing and it's really nice. It's like what I'm saying about with women's rights, like it should be a given. And when you're in Canada, it's a given that people will hold the door open if you have bags or, you know, say hello, good day, how are you? And it's a really, really nice just environment to be in but you never when you're in Canada you don't take it you take it maybe for granted because you don't really notice it's just your part of your daily life and then sometimes when you leave that's when you see the stark contrast and you're like ah oh, I miss when people would hold the door open when I have stuff in my hands. Well I love that you make Canada your home I'm curious about the Montreal tech scene because you're obviously a big part of it uh, is, is it growing? Like, I, I mean, we hear about, of course, Toronto and Vancouver and Waterloo Region and Ottawa. And, but, you know, I don't often hear about the Montreal tech scene. What's it like? I feel like every tech scene says, oh, we're, we're growing. We're the biggest. Yeah, and definitely. of course, everyone's growing together. But Montreal's tech scene is doing very well. We have one of the biggest AI centers here, of course. Um, our advisor, Dr. Yoshua Benjo, is one of the pioneers of machine learning in artificial intelligence. And um, his institute, Mila, the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, is based here in Montreal. So a lot of uh, growth in AI is also being fueled out of Montreal in this region. Uh, so it's a very big, it's happening, it's growing, it's a very lively ecosystem, which I think is the case for all the ecosystems across Canada. It, it's true. And I think I'm glad to see that we're seeing that sector grow and foster. Oh, yeah. Um, are there a lot of grants available for companies that are growing in Montreal? I think Quebec really got it going on, don't they? They do. And there's a lot of different grants available for development. There's Shred, there's IRAP. There's a lot of options available. And I think federally as well, we were, uh, so we we're very fortunate uh, to be invited to speak at the G7 Ministerial for Jobs you of the Future. Yeah, good for you. I did a lot of work around <laughs> It's fantastic. It was fantastic. And um, so at the G7, I met this lady and she's from Innovation Canada. So what she told me is they, uh, I haven't had the chance to try it out myself yet, but I really should. So they created uh, a new website. I think it's innovation.ca. Yeah. And basically you go and you answer a series of questions similar to Butler, uh, I believe. And they'll say, okay, based on your business, these are the grants that are available to you. Yeah, very like at the federal level, I believe provincial as well. So that's an option and a resource that's there for anyone that wants to go look into this kind of thing. You've got a great story. I'm so, so I think we're so fortunate to have you here. Thanks. I would like You're to making me blush again. <laughs> I'd love to do a little rapid fire. So because you're an AI, is it Wally or Rosie? For you? Rosie from Jetsons, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, this is hard because Rosie I grew up with, but but Wally went from a trash compactor to save humanity. So I have to go with Wally. <laughs> Movies or books? Oh, for the most part, books, but sometimes a very good theatrical IMAX movie. Yeah. And you know, it gets your brain out of everything, right? That's yeah, exactly. Just turn off and like live in the moment. <sighs> yes. Uh, ice cream or pie? Oh, ice cream, hands down. Not even a choice. <laughs> You're in Montreal, so I have to ask, um, mm -hmm. is it roast beef or ham? Uh, you guys have those great smoked meat sandwiches there? I think I know. I have a confession. I'm not a fan of <laughs> smoked meat. I feel like it's so offensive when I say it to people. <laughs> Roast beef, but there are other options. At poutine. Let's go. Yeah, poutine. there you go. Why not? <laughs> uh, lamb or lion? Lion. I love big cats. Um, and uh, we were going to say uh, Machu Picchu or the Eiffel Tower. Machu Picchu, because I've never been. The Eiffel Tower is lovely, but I really, really want to go to Machu Picchu. What's next for you? Personally or with Butler? Uh, let's do both. We'll start personally, because I think you're fascinating. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> Could control my little ego boost right now. Um, I would love to see the, the AI, the, the social side of Butler grow to encompass not just more countries, and more languages for the harassment tool, but to uh, grow in terms of the, the tools that we offer for different situations. So let's say maybe employment rights or bringing in human rights and different things that I believe that should be 
fundamental information that everyone has access to, but they don't necessarily have access to without the help of a lawyer or an expensive law degree or uh, something else that's an impediment to them having the knowledge now. And I guess that also answers the question for what I'd like to see with Butler as well. Yeah. Uh, so how do people find you? Uh, channels. Social media. So I really, really, really would love to hear stories of different people. And I love, especially now when people use our tool and they share their stories with me. So definitely uh, either my personal or Bottler's Twitter. So I at Ratika Dutt and Bottler is at Bottler underscore AI or our Facebook page, message us, Instagram, anywhere online. Yeah, and we can find you at same thing. It's at Bottler. Yeah. At Bottler underscore AI and or at Ratika Dutt. Amazing. It's a huge pleasure to meet you. Keep up the amazing work. Sure. We'll put a link um, for your incredible tool when we put the podcast out. So thanks for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I think you're doing a great job with these podcasts and I can't wait for your one day conference. <laughs> Thank you. We got to get you in on the stage speaking. All right. Thanks to everyone uh, who tuned in today. Your comments are welcome and always encouraged. Please subscribe to our Women's March Canada channel uh, podcast and you'll receive updates every time we upload a new podcast, which is usually on Fridays. Our mission across Canada is to stand together in solidarity with our partners and children for the protection of our rights, our safety, our health, and our families, recognizing that our vibrant and diverse communities are the strength of our country. This is Women's March Canada podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Women's March CDA and on our website at womensmarchcanada.com. I'm Melissa Durrell and I'm wishing you a great day. Mm -hmm.